This is CBC Here and Now. Another nor'easter headed to our neck of the woods this weekend. Oftentimes, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. The offenders are more so protected than the victims itself. If you don't talk about these things, then nothing will ever happen. Both of their mothers were murdered. Their killers were both men the victims knew. Tonight, a special series on intimate partner violence. But we're going to start this evening with politics. The province could be going to the polls sooner than many thought. The Liberals are promising to pay government workers for the next six months instead of the next three, just in case the opposition tries to bring down the government. I'm absolutely hopeful <laughs> that members on the other side will vote for the budget uh, this year, Mr. Speaker. But uh, in, a, in a, a, the spirit of uh, being absolutely willing to allow members to vote whatever way they want. I want to ensure, Mr. Speaker, in case they decide they want to try to bring government down, there's sufficient money there to see us through the process. Now, an interim supply bill must be passed before the end of the month, and that's to ensure that tens of thousands of public servants get paid. Now, while Osborne says he's just trying to be responsible and guarantee government workers get their checks, opposition leader Chess Crosby says the Liberals are paving a runway for an early election. A snap election, May or June, is the likelihood. Now, mind you, they've given themselves six months leeway by this unusual piece of legislation to get six months' worth of money. That's not happened before under this government. And so another option they might be thinking of is proroguing the legislature so that the new guy, and there's only two guys in there now, so I'll call it that, um, who will not have a seat in the legislature is not subject to the embarrassment of people being reminded all the time that the premier does not have a seat in the legislature. Now one of the guys that Chess Crosby is talking about who's planning to run for the province's top job is John Abbott. And Abbott launched his campaign this morning. The former deputy minister of health says the government has big problems that need to be fixed. Our Peter Cowan has that story. He spent decades behind the scenes but now John Abbott wants to step into public life and into the province's top job. He's new to politics, but his campaign is being run by former MHA Rex Gibbons. Right off the bat, he's made it clear he wants to do things differently. The status quo was never an option, and it is certainly not one now. In fact, I would suggest that the status quo is our collective enemy. When he was deputy minister, he was vocal about the need to cut health care spending and close hospitals. Their views that he shared publicly in an interview with CBC, an interview he says cost him his job. Today, he's more diplomatic. I think what we'll need to do is manage the resources we have a hell of a lot uh, better. We need to put out a, a multi-year plan where those changes need to be made, encourage dialogue, and then start implementing a plan of change. Abbott is up against another healthcare veteran, surgeon Andrew Fury. Fury already has the backing of most of the Liberal caucus and cabinet. Just two Liberal MHAs showed up for Abbott's launch today. Both say they're still unsure about who they'll support. Fury has the backing of some of the same organizers who brought Ball into power. Abbott has made it clear he wants to go in a different direction. We have focused on making the easy choices, not the hard choices. I worked under the Wales administration uh, where there were very difficult choices made. Uh, we can learn from that period, and we know how now how to do those things better. Abbott and Fury agree on one thing. They're both promising to release the names of everyone who donates to their campaign, even though the Liberal Party doesn't require it. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. an unsettled day today is an area of low pressure sitting offshore. We're into some of that colder air as well, noticeably cooler than it was yesterday. But as we uh, head through the night tonight, we're going to continue to see some flurries and coastal snow and blowing snow for both uh, West Coast and up through Labrador as well. Quiet tomorrow for the majority of us. Just a few flurries in the forecast. But what I'm really watching is another round of snow, mainly affecting eastern Newfoundland at this point. Does look like we're going to see some significant at time accumulations uh, as we head through the weekend. So we'll have those details in your full forecast coming up. One person is dead after a house fire in Springdale. It happened at a home on Main Street. This was just before 10 o'clock this morning. Now it's not clear if there were any other people inside the house at the time. 
A fire scene investigator will be in the community tomorrow to try to determine the fire's cause. Some shocking evidence presented at Supreme Court in connection with a devastating car crash that happened nearly two years ago and a heartbreaking statement from a grieving parent. Terry Roberts reports. Brandon Quilty has admitted to the charge of dangerous driving causing death. And today, a St. John's courtroom found out just how reckless he was on May 17, 2017. This is the aftermath of a horrific single vehicle crash on Blackhead Road in Shea Heights. The crash claimed the life of passenger Justin Murrins, who wasn't wearing a seatbelt. He was ejected from the car. Quilty was also seriously injured, with firefighters having to cut him from the vehicle. A muscle car built for speed. Today, the court heard Quilty's speed. 207 kilometers per hour, according to the car's crash data recorder. Down a winding road with a single lane in both directions, where the max speed is 80. So fast, the suspension bottomed out, the recoil causing the car to fishtail. Quilty lost control. The car skidded, flipped, and spun for hundreds of meters. Sherry Murrins says she still lies in her son's bed at night, crying and wishing he'd come home. Her message for drivers, people need to see what happens when you take unnecessary risks. Speed kills people. When asked if he had anything to say, Brandon Quilty stood and offered a short apology to Murrin's family. The Crown Attorney is recommending Quilty be sentenced to upwards of two years in prison. He also wants Quilty's driving privileges suspended for five years. The defense agrees, but asks for two years in a federal institution. Justice Sandra Chater will hand down her sentence next week. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. A former member of parliament from this province has died after a lengthy illness. Jean Payne had a turbulent career in politics as well as in business. The one-time Liberal MP for St. John's West succeeded John Crosby in the 1993 election. Now that seat had been a Tory fortress. Payne declared personal bankruptcy after losing hundreds of thousands of dollars on a failed training program that was subsidized by the federal and provincial governments. Her financial dealings eventually drove her from office, though she did try for a comeback in 2000. Her family says that Payne was, quote, never daunted by the barriers facing women of her time. She was 80 years old. The final report from the inquiry into the over-budget and overdue Muskrat Falls project is now in the hands of the government. But you won't get to see the findings until a legal review is complete. Natural Resources Minister Siobhan Cody held up a copy of that report this morning, a hefty copy. That report by Justice Richard LeBlanc is three months overdue, six volumes. Cody promises to release it to the public within days once that legal review is complete. Well, Carolyn joins us once again. Good to see you again. Hi. So last <laughs> night we spoke about mayors on the Northeast Avalon, about the possibility of there being a region mm -hmm. and eventually sharing more resources. And of course, the topic of am amalgamation, the A word as we've been calling it, yeah. uh, that came up as well. It yeah. did. And uh, we also heard the mayors mention Halifax as an example of amalgamation gone wrong. 25 years ago, Halifax and neighboring municipalities like Dartmouth consolidated into the Halifax Regional Municipality. So today I spoke with someone who studied the pros and cons of that choice, Dalhousie University Professor Jack Novak. And I started by asking how history has judged the consequences of amalgamation. Uh, I'm not sure the story is completely written. Uh, initially, it was supposed to be a major source of cost savings. Uh, which just did not pan out to be true. The original $10 million savings ended up being additional $26 million in costs. Uh, the difficulty in assessing amalgamations is that nothing is ever stable. You have the amalgamation and as you go on you have uploading and downloading, changes in financial arrangements and nothing is stable. It's very difficult to always extricate that one specific element to make a determination. Amalgamation has in some ways diminished the local in local government. You now have a Halifax regional municipality which is uh, larger than the province of Prince Edward Island. Uh, you now have to have full-time councillors. You now have to have much higher stipends. And you also have uh, an increase in service demands uh, that approximate the highest level of the original participating municipalities. We are far better off to have four or five municipalities which give people 
people a choice as to where they want to live the amenities that they like to have and the taxes that they're prepared to pay there are great benefits and it's largely for those who were under serviced the tendency in amalgamated areas is for the highly serviced wealthier parts of the communities to subsidize the less wealthy part so there's a kind of redistribution of wealth in amalgamated areas now that may be very good and I think most of us would say that's part of the the Canadian culture is to make sure that those who are disadvantaged are, are, uh, are helped the problem with that is that the the property tax is not a tax which is intended to create redistribution and the assumption is that there are economies of scale as you get to larger units that is simply untrue. All of the evidence is, suggests that you get different economies of scale for different services at different population levels. So as you amalgamate, you might create an efficiency in one area, but you will create inefficiencies in another area. What I would say to you, and what I would say to all those who are considering amalgamation, is answer this question first. And if you can answer this question, then perhaps amalgamation is useful for you. What do you get from integration that you cannot achieve through cooperation? And so if you can cooperate on services in which there is a common interest, a common necessity, perhaps a public imperative, such as uh, your community suffered recently with the, the snowstorms, uh, then you can achieve what you need to through uh, greater cooperation, but you don't suffer all of the problems with amalgamation. Well, John Abbott threw his hat into the Liberal leadership race today, and Mr. Abbott says he's going to make sure we talk about some of the difficult things that we need to talk about. It's coming up.
sort of winter again today, yesterday more like spring. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. And yeah. last night's uh, wet, miserable weather didn't stop some athletes from sprinting through uh, a St. John's Park. Hopefully next year we'll have sunshine or not the blowing rain. As of right now, there's over $17,000 raised for Girl Guides Canada. Across the country this week, thousands lacing up to show support for a woman's right to run. This is inspired by a documentary about the first women in Afghanistan to actually be permitted to run a marathon. And this is the first event of its kind in the country, kicked off last night in Bowering Park. So congratulations. And there they are waving, asking Ashley, please, next year, make it a little easier on all of us. Just the rain. It was yeah. beautiful temperature That's true. If we're running, it could be yep. a lot colder. Absolutely. Uh, take a look at the temperatures. Yeah, where we sat today, a little cooler than mm. yesterday. Uh, those numbers sitting in the mine are in, on a plus side of the mercury around one or two degrees, hovering around the zero degree mark for Stephenville this afternoon. And temperatures mild again up through Happy Valley Goose Bay reached a high near minus three today. And if we take a look at the current temperatures, that's exactly where you're still sitting. And those numbers have dropped uh, again because we've got that uh, northerly or northwesterly flow uh, across the island. So we are seeing temperatures back below zero right now, and they're generally going to stay there as we uh, head through the next couple of days. So here's where we're uh, looking at the satellite and radar, that low pressure system just offshore right now. So we do have that onshore flow along the west coast, and we're still looking at flurries, pretty much seeing flurries, uh, scattered flurries across the island. Uh, but up through Labrador is that low is a little closer to you still under those winter storm warnings for Cartwright to Mac uh, and McCovic, Rigolette and Hopedale. You are under blowing snow advisories and that's just because those winds are quite strong combined with that snow. We're going to continue to see that as we head through the overnight tonight. Again, we're also going to see snow and blowing snow across uh, the blowing snow will be in exposed areas along the west coast, but you're generally looking at that potential for flurries and onshore uh, snow along the west coast tonight again along the northeast as well. Well, it will eventually taper off and we should actually see partly cloudy skies tonight. But again, you're going to continue to see that snow uh, for coastal Labrador. Your temperatures are going to dip a little bit more across the island. Minus six for Corner Brook, minus five for Grand Falls, Windsor. And those winds are going to stay breezy tonight, certainly along the west coast. Uh, and then along the east as well, westerlies anywhere from about 50 to 70 kilometers per hour overnight tonight. Temperatures are going to drop for Lab City, minus 20 uh, overnight tonight. And then hanging on to those minus single digit temperatures for uh, Cartwright around minus 7. So through the day tomorrow, generally quiet, generally cloudy though through the day. Uh, can't rule out the chance of a few flurries either for the island. Uh, certainly going to see that onshore activity continuing along the west coast and then up through Labrador as well. Otherwise, a quiet uh, afternoon for you as well. But those winds are going to stay breezy. Eventually that snow will move down uh, towards the northern peninsula and affect you as you head into the evening and uh, overnight hours. So as far as snowfall goes, still thinking we'll pick up uh, some accumulating snow tonight, anywhere from uh, about five to as much as 10 centimeters. In the higher elevations, you could see 10 to 15 centimeters, and then that will continue up through Labrador as well. So you're going to see similar uh, accumulations by the time this snow will eventually taper off through the day. Uh, temperature wise, a little cooler tomorrow, back down into those minus uh, single digits and those winds again are going to stay breezy. Uh, chance of a few peaks of sun, but overall it will be a gray day. Uh, Grand Falls winds are looking at minus three. That flurry activity potentially for Gander can't rule out the chance really anywhere across the island. Uh, onshore flurries will continue. Your winds will stay brisk 20 to 40 kilometers per hour as well in that onshore flow. And then up through Labrador, some flurries continuing for Cartwright and uh, pretty much as you head towards Happy Valley Goose Bay. Lab City looks like a nice day, but a little chilly sitting around minus 14. So we do have a special weather statement in effect for parts of eastern Newfoundland. This is ahead of our next system that's moving in Saturday and will continue through the day on Sunday. I'll have those details coming up. And now there are two. A former longtime civil servant, John Abbott, launched his leadership bid at a downtown hotel in St. John's this morning, telling about 100 people that he is serious about change. The status quo was never an option, and it is certainly not one now. In fact, I would suggest that the status quo is our collective enemy. As a deputy minister to John Hagee, John Abbott had an inside view of our health care system, and he has also worked as a health care consultant, and he joins me now. Thank you for coming on the program. Appreciate that. Good evening, Anthony. Why do you want to be premier? Well, Anthony, the thing that concerns me most right now about the province is the lack of leadership, and we have a series of issues that need to be addressed. And I felt, based on my 
experience in government and outside of government that it is time for me to step forward to take on the challenge to address some of the issues that I feel have been unattended for quite some time. What's your assessment of what's gone wrong with our politics? Well, as I m mentioned you know, in my speech, uh, the, the Liberal Party has a storied history of pr bringing forward you know, very progressive social and economic development uh, changes. But in recent years, and this even goes back to the uh, previous administration, we have not really stepped up to the uh, challenges that our society and our economy are facing. And principally those are fiscal and health? There are fiscal and on the social sector, whether it's education, justice, health, a lot of unanswered uh, issues uh, that I feel need to be addressed. Uh, we have the knowledge, we have the skills, we have the evidence that suggests that change can be made, but it has to start now, soon. Now you said you were, you were getting into this because you did not want to stand aside any longer and watch the continued uh, stasis or inaction, right? Is it possible for anybody to talk about the difficult things that need to be done and actually get elected in this province? Well, I think this is going to be the test. I am putting a platform forward that is going to challenge my competitor, as well as the party, as well as the province. What kind of province do we want going forward? I want to make sure we can have a healthy debate on the serious issues, put the information and perspectives out there, and have a healthy discussion. How do you actually talk about changing health care without your opponent saying, oh, he's going to cut it. He's going to cut the living daylights out of our health care system. Look, Newfoundland and Labrador's health system can be the envy of the, of the rest of Canada. We have the skills, resources, knowledge to really change our system. We just haven't done it. What has held us back has been inactive, inefficient, and uh, political expediency that has not allowed us to make the decisions, to make the changes that we need to make. But let me ask you about the, the beginning of the race now, all right? So your event was come and meet me over tea and muffins uh, in a nice sort of docile environment. Andrew Fury's launch was banners, razzmatazz, almost the entire cabinet, all those MHAs. He too says he's about change. When you see those cabinet ministers and those MHAs, 15 of them, mm -hmm. is that team capable of change? Uh, well, I think you've, you, know, you paint the difference. And the difference for me is that I know what needs to be done, I know how to get it done, and we will need to get it done soon. On the other hand, even though Dr. Fury has many people with him who work with Dwight Ball and that caucus and those cabinet ministers, that's a lot of organizational firepower. A lot of people think you're a long shot in this race, that's no surprise to you. I mean, to some degree, you know, you're the snowball mm -hmm. and Andrew Fury is your hell. Mm -hmm. w what makes you think you can win this? Well, based on the, you know, the conversations I've had since day one, which is less than three weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, to talk to people and who've encouraged me to say, look, John, you have the ideas, you have the knowledge, you have the expertise. That's what we need in government right now. And, uh, and I think people will, uh, will, will, sort of will and are accepting that message. They will trust me to do that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that is going to be the test going forward. All right. We'll see if people and liberals in particular are ready for your uh, tough medicine. Thank you very much for uh, this first of what I hope will be a number of appearances on Here and Now. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, very much.
Welcome back to Here and Now. One was six years old, another was 18, and the third was a witness. Tonight, Here and Now is launching a special series of stories that focus on intimate partner violence as well as homicide. In 2018, more than 75 Canadian children lost a parent because of intimate partner violence. And the stories that you're about to hear, they're disturbing, but as Ariana Kellen reports, the children who were left behind, they want you to hear what happened, difficult as the details may be. I drew a picture of a man holding an ax and a woman's body on the ground with blood around it. So obviously the police knew then that I was a witness to what had happened. I constantly think, you know, I'm going to be another statistic and I don't want that to happen. You never think that your boyfriend is going to shoot you in the face and kill you. At 26 years old, Daniel Benoit has already outlived his mom. We always had a swing set outside, so birthday parties and stuff like that. Mom would always take us out on the swings and just so many memories that I have from her that I'll, that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Then there are the memories he would rather forget. I remember pretty much everything. On a warm July night in 1997, four-year-old Daniel was asleep in his bedroom when his father, Dale Ogden, came in his home. Ogden, a menacing figure who abused Judy Ogden and her two children before she cut it off for good. The couple was heading for divorce, the court order telling him to stay away, now inconsequential. I remember he came into my room and he woke me up and what this man had told me, as sick as this may seem, he said that there was a dog in the house that was trying to hurt mom. And he said, you're gonna hear some screams and some noises, but he said, I, I'm gonna kill the dog. And he basically took my hand and walked me out in the hallway where he then proceeded into my mother's room. And, you know, he basically just went at her with brute force. I watched my mom literally take, you know, her last breath, so to say, in a way that I should never have to do that. His father cleaned up, grabbed Daniel's baby sister from her crib, and took the two children back to his home in nearby Kippens. The next day, Dale Ogden brought the children back home. He took a neighbor's ladder to Judy Ogden's bedroom window. This guy brought me up the ladder. So then not only, you know, did I have to relive it, you know, last, like the night before that, I had to look at it in broad daylight. So as we went up the ladder, the last image that I ever remember seeing is my mother's body laying on the floor next to her bed. And it's probably an image that I may never shake out of my head. Ogden was often seen in the yard playing with her three-year-old son and 14-month-old daughter, children that are now in the care of social services. Neighbors say it's difficult. Daniel Benoit's own evidence would be a key piece to the RCMP's puzzle drawing a picture of a man with an axe and a woman on the floor. Dale Ogden was sentenced in 2000 to life in prison for second degree murder. The judge set his parole eligibility at 14 years. I was thinking about my future and I was so, I had they had given me so much confidence, I wanted to go on to be a lawyer. You know, I think you have a different outlook on life when stuff like this happens to you. I mean, you, you've experienced so much at a young age that, you know, you gain knowledge that most people don't get within their lifetime. It wasn't until grade 10 that Daniel Benoit could look at a photo of his mom without throwing up. Today, he wishes he could see more. <coughs> Especially for his own son, Dominic. <coughs> who is four. Everything that happened to her and the red flags that I've seen, you know, I can educate my son from an early age and basically teach him how to treat women the right way. It was a 
night of unfortunate drama in East End St. John's. It began in this apartment building off Door My Bay name Road. is Laura Lee Gillingham. I am the surviving daughter of my mom who was murdered, Brenda Gillingham. Cecil Pintergast murdered her. 39-year-old Brenda Gillingham began dating Pentergast in the mid-90s. Her teenage daughter, Laura Lee, didn't like him from the start. He had her completely brainwashed. He, she wasn't allowed to see any of her family or, or anything. He, she wasn't allowed to be attentive to me. Pentergast had control, knew where she was, and watched the apartment, even when they were in a relationship. Then she took control and broke it off. On July 27, 2000, Cecil Pentergast came to collect his things. And she said, well, I'll be over tonight. Right. It'll all be over tonight, she said. This is the emergency exit door. Um, it's always locked, but the reason why he came to this door and not the front door is because there are no cameras here. Okay. He came up and he banged on the door. One of the children from the apartment recognized him as Brenda's boyfriend. So they ran and let him right in. He went down the hall to the second apartment and drove himself into the door, taking off our uh, welcome sign, as he did, screaming, I'm going to f***ing kill you. Pentergast was intoxicated and brought a 12-gauge shotgun. Laura Lee's 14-year-old brother was home at the time. He heard a bang. He said, okay, that's just the barbecue. He said he heard another bang. Okay, that's just the barbecue. Then he said he heard a big bang. And he said, that's not the barbecue. And he ran up over the stairs. And the first thing he saw, what he told me, was what he thought mom would have played a joke on him and thrown spaghetti onto the wall. And when he looked down, it wasn't. It was her face. It was her head. It was her brain. I don't come here. I try to avoid it at all costs coming here. This was her in her 20s. Her smile is beautiful. It's so, it's contagious. You can't help but smile when you look at her big, beautiful smile. Today, Laura Lee Gillingham is left with just photos and lots of questions. What happened has changed her as a woman and colored the way she raised her own child, a son. He filled my heart. He filled my, the hole in my heart. It's still there, but having him was the best thing that ever happened to me, saved my life. Laura Lee taught her son how to treat women and never thought she would be mistreated herself. I really thought I would know. I ended up in a relationship a few years ago, actually, that I was being abused verbally. She knows the signs and knows the consequences. Unlike her mom, Laura Lee made a plan, got an apartment and an emergency protection order. She made a clean break, and today she's an advocate. Domestic violence relationships can and will end in homicide. That's the ultimate ending, the ultimate control. If I can't have her, nobody can. The detail needs to come out. Murder is not, it's not pretty. Artist Mary Evans was a 24-year-old mom of two. Her killer was a man close to her. After a day of drinking, Scott Gautier strangled Evans using her own rawhide necklace. Six-year-old Amina and her younger brother were left with just memories of a mom. We 
used to go for lots of walks downtown. We used to make Rice Krispie Squares every chance that we could get. Um, we would go to the store and get caramel squares and we would jump on the bed and play airplane and, you know, all the great moments you can have with a mom we had. Amina Evans Harlick is about the same age now as her mom was when she died and she looks just like her. It's like the best thing to look like my mom because I think she's the most beautiful woman in the entire planet and, uh, you know, to look like her is a blessing. <laughs> With so few years together, Amina loves hearing stories about her mom. Like her time in the art scene in downtown St. John's, it helps dull the ache of those missing moments. I see around every day daughters with their mothers. And I'm jealous. I, uh, I had my first boyfriend and my first heartbreak and I couldn't run to my mom. She wants to keep the name Mary Evans alive. I'm really scared and that has stuck with me since that day. Amina testified at the inquiry into murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. She vows to keep talking and for people to never forget. It kind of feels like it's something that we can't talk about even though we should talk about it. Um, we're losing so many women and so many mothers and daughters and just people in general that something needs to be done. And, you know, if no one stands up for them, who is? The man who killed Laura Lee's mom pleaded guilty to second degree murder. His parole eligibility was set at 15 years. I hope he rots because he deserves this. He's a bastard. Finally, we could rest now. We're going straight to the graveyard and tell the mom it's all over. But it wasn't over. No, that's not what happened at all. There were constant appeals. There were, you know, court dates. Cecil Pentergast is out now. He's happy. He has a girlfriend. He has a new life. Laura Lee Gillingham wants stricter sentences to deter others from committing the same crimes. She also wants an online database of convicted woman abusers so people can know what they're getting into. Every unjust sentence bullies the victim. They don't think about us. My mom doesn't get to be escorted around. Right? She doesn't get to go on day parole. She doesn't get to come back after 15 years. Right? But he does. Back in Stephenville, Daniel Benoit plans to face his mother's killer at his next parole hearing. Dale Ogden was released in 2016 and began dating again. Ogden breached his conditions and is currently back in jail. Daniel's ready to see him face to face to show that despite it all, he's grown into a good man and father in spite of him. You got the better of her, but you'll never get the better of me. <laughs> Arianna Kelland, CBC News, Stephenville.
Well, consultant Gordon McIntosh and his hefty $350,000 contract with Nalcor hit the floor of the legislature once again today. Nalcor's oil and gas division hired him to help transition the operation into a new entity, OilCo. But details of how much he is being paid, including his $36,000 housing allowance, has the opposition pressing the government to end that contract. People of the province continue to be outraged about the $350,000 part-time contract and $36,000 annual housing allowance for an individual who rarely comes to the province and doesn't pay taxes here. Instead of waiting for a review, will the minister stand in her place now and cancel this lucrative contract? Mr. Speaker, there is a board of directors uh, at, uh, at the oil company. There is a CEO at the oil company. If they require uh, consultants, they are reviewing what consultants they need in the go going forward and moving forward and continuing the growth and opportunity in our oil and gas industry. They're reviewing what contracts they have, Mr. Speaker. And I will leave that, uh, that decision-making authority within the corporation itself, Mr. Speaker. Well, in fact, that new division does not have a CEO in place yet, and that's something I asked the minister about outside of the House today. Miss hmm. Cody, in the House, you said that Oilco has a CEO. Um, that apparently is not the case. Jim Keating is not the CEO. There is no CEO. <laughs> the CEO is in transition. You're correct, technically correct. As we said all throughout this entire process, we are moving the employees from Nalcor, uh, Nalcor Oil and Gas Company into the new oil company. Right. We have transitioned uh, all of the employees and we're in the process of transitioning the CEO. So. so when it comes to getting accountability for why this province is paying a consultant a $36,000 housing allowance even though he lives in Scotland, who do we ask that question to? So the contract, as I understand it, was negotiated between the CEO of Nalcor Oil & Gas, which is Jim Keating, who is now the move, transitioning to the oil right, company. Right, but we can't ask him about it because of this transition. And you're a taxpayer here. What do you think about paying somebody who lives in Scotland $36,000 a year to have a place in St. John's? Well, certainly, the, you know, contracts seem very, very uh, robust. There's no doubt about that. And there are questions, of course, that have to be answered around whether that's reasonable. I do understand that, uh, what I do understand is that Mr. Uh, McIntosh has been here for about 130 days last year. And if you do the math, um, it, it does work out to, because uh, it's all inclusive, the, the $3,000 per month. But allow me but to what, say, what do you just, think excuse about me, it? just allow me to finish my statement. I will say that the contract was negotiated for the oil company, Nalcor Oil and Gas Company transitioning to the oil company. So the, co the contract rests with the oil company. And if you have questions around why that contract is as it is, I would suggest you talk to the... Okay, but you know the contract exists. You know the $36,000 stipulation for mm -hmm. a housing allowance. I'm asking Siobhan Cody personally, what do you think of that allowance? You said robust. What do you it mean? is a what, robust contract. So what do you mean when you say robust? I, it's, it's a lot of money. There's no doubt it's a lot of money. But I didn't negotiate the contract. I don't know what the provisions of that contract were. And I, I suggest that you talk to the person who negotiated that contract. To other news now, creativity knows no bounds here in Newfoundland and Labrador, from pottery and painting to sculpting and even creating comic books. In our new series, Drawn to It, we take a peek inside the artistic process, and tonight it's with cer ceramic artist Jason Hawley. Hi, I'm Jason Hawley, um, and I make stuff. I mostly work in ceramics, so um, I make cups and I make sculpture. Um, yeah, that's me. Clay's pretty unique um, in that you, you're sculpting directly with your fingers. There's, it's very, very um, not tool intensive. I think better with my fingertips. This gets jumbled and chaotic and this is always simple and I just prefer this. When you sit down at the potter's wheel, especially, um, you put your hands in the clay, you're just grounded. It just feels calming. In pottery, as a general thing, my favorite thing to make are pinch pots. Just simple little um, tea bowls or um, shot glasses. I make a lot of little whiskey cups. I think virtual reality comes in because I'm a geek. I just think that's that's what it comes down to. A really good friend bought the Oculus developer kit, one of the early iterations of, of virtual reality. So I was I had access to that early on. One day I yeah, was just rooting through the possible programs and I found this one called Google Blocks. 
So it turned from a game platform into a tool that I could actually make things with. So I'm just sort of sketching out forms and picking the right one and so then I'll decide to get that printed and then I go pick that up and when it comes to the studio then it's not virtual anymore now I'm just doing pottery um, so I pour a special plaster onto the plastic print and that sets up and makes the mold you know start to finish to make one cup um, from the design to actually holding the cup can be two or three months but then once you're set up with the mold you can make them sort of in batches the favorite part of the process is opening the glaze kiln it's it's Christmas, because you don't know what they're going to look like, especially not the new ones with all the swirl patterns in them. I don't consciously, like, I don't go sit by the ocean and sketch. I'm not going out and taking visual information from the world and bringing it to the studio, not intentionally, but someone came in and saw my 3D cups over the summer and said, oh my god, what a genius idea, you've made iceberg cups, and I didn't intend to make iceberg cups, but as soon as she said that, they're obviously iceberg cups. So yeah, my, I come from, from process, but I seem to always make things that people see Newfoundland in. I've always made stuff. It would just make no sense to stop. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. So I had this dream that my snowblower left me a note saying how much it misses me. And it was a premonition. <laughs> it was. <laughs> It absolutely yeah. was, yeah. Snow is coming. Another weekend system just in time. All right. Why not? Let's take a look. Let's take a look. So we do have that special weather statement in effect uh, for all of eastern Newfoundland at this point. And uh, yeah, so we're going to see that snow start into the afternoon on Sunday, uh, Saturday rather. So here's we are, here we are by 9 p.m. So you can see we starting to see some of that heavier snow overnight. And uh, we're going to keep an eye on where that rain snow line is because right now it's 
inching further uh, offshore, which means we're going to stay in the snow at this point. Again, we do have a couple of days to iron that out, but this is what it's looking like right now. That snow pretty much extending through central, not quite reaching the west coast as, uh, as far as it goes right now. And this will be over two days. So you can see as we head into Sunday or uh, yeah, Sunday afternoon, we're still into some of that snow, but that low will pull off uh, into the evening. So as far as snowfall amounts, again, this will be over two days and this will more than likely change. But this is an early idea of what to expect, probably thinking closer to 25 centimeters for the metro area, anywhere from 15 to 25 centimeters for the metro area. As you head towards central, that'll be uh, significantly less, uh, maybe 5 to 10 to as much as 15 centimeters possible for a uh, gander. And uh, some of the snow could be pretty fluffy, so these amounts might jump up just a little bit as we head towards central. But overall, that's a good idea of uh, what we're going to see. And the temperatures on Saturday will be well below zero, so about minus five for St. John's. Wind's not overly impressive with this one. We're looking at gusts maybe 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Some areas may see upwards of 60 kilometers per hour. So although they're not overly impressive, we will probably see some uh, blowing snow with some of those higher snowfall rates. Uh, but as we head up to Labrador and really the West Coast, you're going to sit this one out. You're still going to see the potential for some flurries, but overall uh, not a whole lot going on for you. Lab City minus 12 through the day on Saturday. Plenty of sunshine for you, and that's because a ridge of high pressure is going to dominate. So minus 9 for Cartwright, and then along the straight, you're looking at about minus 5. So here's Monday, uh, heading into Monday morning. We'll see some flurries along the West Coast. That's that onshore flurries that I was telling you about. And then uh, pretty much quiet as we head into Monday, an area of high pressure into Tuesday will keep things pretty quiet. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise. Notice that dip uh, into the minus teens as we head into early next week. So temperatures will be below zero yet again. And then um, we're looking at uh, central Newfoundland sunshine at this point for both Monday and Tuesday as we uh, see that ridge of high pressure dominate. Uh, onshore flurries possible for western Newfoundland as we head into the beginning of next week. But again, your temperatures dipping potentially into the minus 20s. Uh, minus 20s uh, as your overnight lows for Labrador as well. Uh, dipping down into the minus teens by Monday and Tuesday. And then for Western Labrador, you're looking at sunshine, maybe a few flurries through the day on Sunday. Take a look at this one. Wow, I, I see some kind of wolf-like animal exactly. peering up. Exactly, Mother Nature is, right? is an artist. Super. <laughs> I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Okay, new feature in here now, psychological analysis of your photo of the day. <laughs> what do you see in this fantastic photo that Ashley has for us today? Yeah, take a look at that one. Uh, I don't know about you, but I see some sort of animal. At first I was thinking wolf, but now there's almost like a mane underneath. You see that? That yeah. sort of stuff out where the chest would be? This is an incredibly uh, well wow. proportioned or well uh, composed. composed photo. Yeah, so this one was taken actually in Portland Creek Pond, just outside of Daniels Harbor. Nice spot, good part of the island. And who sent it to us? Uh, Breda? Breda Tucker, Tucker, yeah. So Breda, what do you... Uh, I know you're watching tonight, Breda. What do you see in that picture? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to get? I, I see some kind of wolf dog like creature. It is incredible, though, what the wind can do, hey? Or lion. Yeah, that's a exactly lion. what I was thinking. Yeah, it could a be a lion. lion. Yep. Bit, bit cold in this part of the Serengeti. <laughs> 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 Mother Nature is a beautiful artist, so that's for sure. Uh, thank you so much for sending that photo in. And if you have any to share with us, send them to NL Photos at CBC. It looks like it's actually staring across the, the water. Across right? the water there. Fantastic, across, Breda. Across the pond. Yes, All right, so thank you, you so much. She, uh, Breda has set a very, very high bar. <laughs> But there's lots of beautiful pictures to be taken out there Absolutely. in the glorious weather. Uh, send them to us. Tomorrow's Friday. It is. Time to see who's celebrating anniversaries and birthdays already. Yep. What a week. It's been uh, a week. All right, we'll wrap that up with you guys tomorrow. Thanks a lot for watching. Good night.